All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, this is an interesting topic. I feel like it's very hot right now, very trendy and timely is why we're here. I'll go give quick introductions. I'm Allison Herzog. I had corporate marketing and B2B marketing at Visa based out of Austin, Texas. So thank you for the cooler weather. It will be 88 degrees on Thursday. This feels a lot better. And then I have Sam Gottfried, Director of Client Partnerships from Quantcast. Do you want to do a quick intro? Uh, so I'm based out of Toronto, Canada, so thank you for the same weather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> director of, uh, of client partnerships at, uh, at Quantcast. Uh, we're a leading data and AI company. We operate the largest measurement panel on the open internet today, and that allows us to uh, deliver really class-leading analytics for uh, advertisers, but also uh, class-leading outcomes across the open internet as well. Hey, everybody. Uh, Mike Myrna with the Mars Agency. Boulder, Colorado, 82 degrees this week. Very happy about that, <laughs> although I'm missing it. Um, the Mars Agency is a 50-plus-year-old connected commerce agency, and we are the AOR for brands like Anheuser-Busch and Campbell's and a bunch of others, as well as a few retailers like Walmart Canada, 7-Eleven, Tractor Supply. And we do everything from traditional shopper marketing to e-commerce. We buy a lot of retail media, uh, data and analytics, connected commerce mixed marketing. So, uh, yeah, that's what we do. Carrie Cipher, I live here, so you can look out the window probably and get all the data you need on weather. Um, I'm with GWI. Uh, we're a consumer market research platform on demand, so about three billion different customers globally. What they view, hope, dream, and behave around uh, can be found on demand on our platform. Perfect, thank you. And I will tell you when we were having our introduction call and getting to know each other. I was just blown, blown away just by the level of data that even at Visa, I know we have 150 billion plus data points, but then I hear all of these different companies, technology, consumer insights, and it just, we're in the era of technology. It is its own industrial revolution. <clears throat> So the first question I have is around ChatGPT, because we have to talk about ChatGPT in this session. Not gonna lie, my first set of questions may have come from ChatGPT. <laughs> I mean, why not? So along the lines of ChatGPT, we see a lot of technology coming through, but not rapid adoption. But with ChatGPT, it actually, in the last few months, just had rapid adoption to the point where at Visa, where I'm at, they actually quickly developed a, we'll call it safe chat GPT. Lots of conversations though around it. Sam, what are you seeing around interesting use cases? You know, how is this also affecting our businesses and individual people's work? I think on the individual level, there's a lot of fears about kind of the AI apocalypse as it relates to uh, the job market. And, and a lot of it's largely overblown. This is not necessarily general purpose AI. It's very purpose driven from chat GPT to uh, generative image solutions, all those things. Um, one of the, the fascinating uses we are seeing though is people just saving a ton of time through using AI to enhance existing workflows. Uh, I think the most prominent example that I can uh, kind of come up with right now, using actually my brother who's a, a front-end developer, ChatGPT is now becoming a standard process to actually optimize and check their code. They're still expected to write their own code, but they now have this fantastic tool that has access to libraries and libraries of existing code that can be cross-checked. Um, so I think in terms of just simplification of workflows, it's going to go a, a super long way. Yeah, that's really interesting. I tend to think of my own world where you see in marketing a lot of copy, you know, like that's where we're seeing a lot of chat GPT, blog posts, campaigns, et cetera. So it's so interesting to hear also how it's developed or how it's influencing different types of jobs. Mike, have you seen in any interesting use cases or how it's changing industry? Yeah, you can't ignore generative AI, whether it's chat GPT or anything else. We're using it in a myriad of different ways, certainly Writing code is, is one of the, the lowest hanging fruit opportunities for us. Creative is really important. We have 100 plus people that do creative. And we really want to eventually get them to evolve from doing the more menial type of creative. Maybe it's item and price and different versioning, and different backgrounds. AI can take care of that. But moving them into more thoughtful creative and letting them spend more time thinking about that original idea, 
So we're definitely uh, evolving into that. Uh, we recently have built a platform that sits on top of Amazon Marketing Cloud. If you know anything about AMC, you need to be a coder right now to be able to extract real value out of it. A lot of us are not coders. A lot of marketers aren't coders, but we want them to have access to it. So we wrote uh, a platform that sits on top so you can do queries and just pull it out. And we're using ChatGPT as a way to allow marketers to converse with it, ask questions, and then extract value out that normally only their data scientists could do. So that's an interesting one. But I will say governance is really important, and we're very careful. We do not use our clients' uh, proprietary information to train models. Um, you know, when we're doing creative, a lot of our clients want copyright uh, protection, which you can't really get with AI. So there's, you, you got to be careful with how you use it. That's my watch out. Yeah, that's really interesting as well. And I've seen that, you know, my own company, other companies, that's where there was a lot of noise early on was all of a sudden everybody was on it. I personally was like, oh, I'm one of those not, I'm an early adopter, but not the earliest adopter. Mm -hmm. Because I'm normally like, oh, you know, Apple's pushing an update. I don't want the first one because there's going to be a bug. <laughs> Give me the second one. <laughs> um, so there has been an issue around ChatGPT and proprietary knowledge. A lot of artists putting their art in, out into the world, and then is it truly theirs? There's question marks. So that one I think is really interested around, around AI has been around for so long. So it's one of those topics that honestly, at first I eye rolled. But generative AI, like you said, Mike, that's really where the difference is happening. So lots of things around data, and privacy carry something that we really we talked about last week that was so interesting to me was what's happening with consumers where where are we with privacy that's changed so much across the last few years access to data control around privacy you know we're all getting notices constantly around do you want to allow tracking for xyz what are you seeing in your consumer insights as to how people feel so i did some digging and I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is for customers, they're not waking up thinking about data privacy. The bad news is because this is the list of stuff they're waking up thinking about. Gun violence, abnormal government, uh, racism, homophobia, climate change, uh, the economy, their health care, et cetera. So I think sometimes as marketers, we are ahead of the curve and need to think about how to protect consumers. But the good news is when you look at the list of things they're most worried about, data privacy is pretty low, and AI is even lower than that. And as a matter of fact, I would say when you look at the consumer lens, they're downright excited about AI, specifically finding information quicker, and then also there's this entertainment value that consumers are reporting. They're having a really good time with it, and I think that's why AI's been around a long time, but it's been so nerdy, and it's finally not nerdy, it's finally actually a good time for consumers, and that's why we're all like, well, we've been at this for a while, but consumers are like, well, I haven't, and I just like put myself in a Superman suit, and I look baller. Thanks, AI. So I, I do think that we think people are maybe more worried than they are. Um, I will say this from a data privacy perspective. They're not waking up thinking about it, but 51% will boycott your brand if you fuck with it. Right? So they don't care until something goes wrong, and then they are out. And so I do think it is, it, what I'm saying is, you still need to take it very seriously, but there's a lot of other things that your consumers and your customers are taking more seriously that they expect you to take a stand around before data privacy. That, I, love, I love that last quote. I'm not going to repeat the word. Because <laughs> it will be filmed and my children will see at some point in their lives. <clears throat> um, and then they'll want to know why they can't say the word. In terms, of, I mean, it's so true with the brands, you know, like being accountable, responsible with data. You know, like I think we are increasing, that's one of the things we have as companies is to also be accountable and responsible with that data. I, can, I won't name brands, but there's certainly ones I've seen where they've had a data breach and they either handled it well or they didn't handle it well. They either acknowledged they had a problem and they were imperfect 
and here's the resolution, here's what they're doing about it, or they tried to minimize it. They tried to use their comms team, who's you know, I'm sure very talented, but they just tried to not be transparent, and that does not work in today's world. Around the lens of how things are changing around data collection, cookie deprecation has been one of those things we've talked about for a long time. I think it's always been kind of in the future. And so it's like, oh, I don't know if I need to deal with it quite yet. You know, like, ah, no, it's coming. It's kind of like when GDPR happened. It was like, oh, we're going to get there. And then I remember, probably a lot of you remember, when it came down. And the cookie acknowledgments were hilarious in terms of either super formal, really long, or like, hey, by the way, the most generic, casual, I'm going to be collecting your data. But Mike, what do we, like, tell me about cookie deprecation. What do we need to be doing? What do we need to be worried about? What are the key points around it that are now real, real? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening, and it's, you can't bury your head in the sand about it. It's funny, there are, it seems like there's two types of people, either those that completely just leave it up to other people to figure it out, or those that are actively working to do something about it. Um, and I'm optimistic that it, it's not a sky is falling scenario. You know, universal IDs are promising. Uh, I think they need to expand their penetration into the open web more, but there, you know, that's a thing. It's gonna help crack some of that. Um, we're seeing a lot of budget shifting into retail media. You guys have heard that quite a bit today probably. I think a big part of that, and we do retail media for a lot of retailers, and we buy it and we sell it, but a big part of that is because of the first party data. And brands know that retailers have some of the best data in the world. Like if you look at Amazon, which is a marketplace, not really a retailer, 17 of the top 20 advertisers on their DSP are not endemic, so they don't sell anything on Amazon. That tells you how much brands value that data. And they don't have it. And so one of the things we see is a shift into retail media for that reason, plus the closed loop measurement doesn't hurt. But we also think it's because brands, they know they need that first party data and that's the best play right now. So our advice to brands is invest in retail media, but also build up your own first party data. Because increasingly with, with uh, clean rooms, you can bring your data to the party and really make some special audience segments out of that. Do you have any recommendations for how we can do a better job of collecting first party data? Well, whether it's zero party data or first party data, zero is really what you want, which for anybody who doesn't know, let me make sure I get this right. All zero party data is first party data, but not all first party data is zero party data. Okay, think kindergarten that. that one for me. <laughs> yeah, think about that. Um, but zero party data is where the user is giving full consent. They, they know what they're doing. Um, so that's a value exchange. That's about giving the consumer a reason to hand over as much of their information as makes sense in that moment. So what is your value exchange in order to get that data? Uh, one of the things I'm, we're working on right now uh, is a thing we call a connected commerce pass where it's using um, card technology with blockchain to uh, get that first party data, but we're offering quite a value to the consumer for that. So I think the big takeaway is you can get the data, but you have to have a reason for them to give it to you. What's your reason? That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Sam, question that relates to that is just around our expectations. I mean, I have an expectation, our customers have an expe expectation around personalization, which involves a lot of segmentation, a lot of data points. How, you know, like how do we do that in an effective manner? You know, even examples from Quantcast in terms of how are you guys approaching segmentation and personalization to deliver what we all expect? And frankly, if the experience is not frictionless, we won't give any data. You're getting nothing if it's not done well. Uh, I think that data and AI is really going to start to uh, impact really every facet of a brand's interaction with consumers in general. And beyond, uh, beyond our industry, we look at things like one of the clients that we're working with, a uh, large financial institution, is now starting to integrate consumer data into their chatbots to better serve them. So that can be, if you want an insurance quote, we already know what vehicle you have. Um, you want to change your coverage? Let's make that easy. You don't actually have to interact with a human. We can do it all through a chatbot. I think that you know, stems back to privacy a little bit, and there's definitely some concerns there. But uh, in terms of wider personalization, I think it's just, a, to your point, a baseline expectation. Um, brands need to be prepared to deliver on it, and technology providers do as well. 
what we do at Quantcast is essentially personalization through placement and, uh, and audience segmentation, um, as well as creative. So for us, that means analyzing in real time uh, about 10,000 behavioral attributes before we actually serve an impression. And those are refreshed every four seconds. So because we have such a large panel, we're able to really accurately distinguish between who's interested in your product and who's not and deliver them a, a relevant impression at the right time for them. And I'll use myself as an example. I'm a, a male 18 to a, a certain age range. We'll <laughs> quite give that away. Uh, watch we get of... Seinfeld references. We had this discussion before we got on the stage of somebody made a Seinfeld reference to me last, or I made a Seinfeld reference and they, George Costanza and the napping desk, who knows that? <laughs> Maybe it's who doesn't know that. <laughs> but that's how I knew he was older, or I was older than he was. So 18 to something. 18 to something. You can see the beard, you know, it's, it's all great. Um, but we, uh, using myself again as an example, uh, 18 to something, watch a ton of sports. The amount of money that has been spent over the course of my adult life trying to sell me a pickup truck has to be astronomical at this point. Uh, I live in downtown Toronto. I have two kids. I'm unlikely to buy one. Um, what we allow marketers to pick up on, and, and frankly, it's annoying to me, but what we allow marketers to pick up on is uh, all of the nuanced behavior I display beyond that. Like I'm looking at parenting blogs on an iPad, at night, uh, researching sleep training for my 18-month-old. All things that would indicate that I may not necessarily be the best fit for this ad. And I think marketers in general need to uh, move beyond those kind of cookie-cutter behavioral segments and into more intelligent segmentation to deliver on personalization. I love, uh, you know, like I think that's a perfect example of it used to be as marketers we would bucket people. It's natural to want to categorize and put people in buckets. We still do personas, right? We, you know, to put a face to who we're selling to. But you know, something that might seem st that's a perfect example of why personalization is deep segmentation needs to happen because you don't want a truck. All those ads, like there's probably a few brands you can mention, but they're wasting their media dollars. I, but I know we're all being very thoughtful. <laughs> Although, after, afterwards, you could always talk to those people because they probably want to know they're wasting their money. Yeah. Um, along those lines, Sam, what role does data analytics and AI play in shaping the future? Because uh, that we're getting smarter, how are we getting smarter through data analytics and AI? So I don't necessarily think data and analytics is going to uh, you know, magically make everyone smarter, but I think it's going to revolutionize the way that people are able to spend time in their day-to-day -day tasks. So uh, you know, using, again, Quantcast as, a, as an example, the platform that we've built has been rooted in AI and machine learning since 2006. We've been pioneers at this. Uh, we've been talking about AI for a long time. It's, it's kind of really lining up now as this is the year of AI. Um, but uh, from our perspective, using these tools just frees up your time. If you don't have to parse out audiences, if you don't have to optimize campaigns, if you can use chat GPT as a, as a basis for your panel questions and then further refine it, um, it gives you more time to focus on more important, more strategic work. And that's where we see the real benefits of, of AI for, uh, for the workforce. Of course, there are going to be some job casualties, but we do think there will be uh, more jobs created through, uh, through AI as a tool. Thank you. One, one thing that's sort of interesting about about AI and tools in general is um, we have a work product and it uh, asks a lot of questions of employees, which good ones are really hard to come by. And it turns out the, the proliferation of tools inside of your org, including AI, gives employees a sense that they work for an innovative company. And 34% of those that are using AI more prolifically as a tool, along with other tools inside the company, are more satisfied with their job. And therefore, you have less turnover. So I think a lot of the times we think about how we're going to use it for the end product, but you don't think about how it satisfies employees and it gives them a real sense of job satisfaction and pride to know, I work for an innovative company who's willing to test this stuff and it furthers my career so they stick around. So there's a lot of employee satisfaction associated with tools inside of your org, including AI. That's that sort of interesting. That's an amazing point, especially if we think about how do we keep top talent. It's so expensive in this day and age. So employee, employee satisfaction is critical, and we do like shiny new toys. We do want to learn or be, and you know, never become stagnant. 
Mike, something you had mentioned last week that I, I just didn't really know or hadn't really considered was just how retailers and brands are working together because there is access to reams of data that re retailers can provide. How, like, what are you seeing happen between retailers and brands? How are those relationships coming together? You know, any tips, tricks around omni-channel? Yeah, and just one comment about the last part. I heard something, it's not my quote, but I thought it was, it, to me, it inspired me. And it's that marketers are not um, competing with AI. You're competing with other marketers who use AI. And that, to me, really talked about, you know, the, val the value that we have to uh, get from it. So uh, marketers, retailers, we're seeing more and more integrated partnerships with retailers for the reasons I mentioned before, great first party data, closed loop measurement, increasingly taking that data and porting it outside of just their owned and operated uh, assets into the open web and elsewhere. So you can use that for all of your marketing purposes, clean rooms and um, marketing mix model within there like AMC, where you can really start to see the impact on all of your investments across the entire shopper journey. Uh, so there's a, there's a common um, pattern that retailers have. When they first start building this retailer media network, they tend to be very guarded with the data, guarded with the analytics, because they don't know if it's gonna work or they don't know what parts of it are gonna work. And as they get more confidence, they start and a little bit more mature and sophisticated, they start to open it up more and guess what? They get more budgets that way because any brand here will tell you, I'm only gonna give so much money to a retailer because I have to give a certain amount to play ball in a lot of cases, but I'm not gonna give you more than that until you show that this works better than what I can do elsewhere, right? And retail media comes at a premium, but it comes with a lot of benefits. So I, I, we see this journey that all retailers take where they start off close and then they start to open it up they expand all the attribution and you know an API connections so that a brand can ingest all the data from the analytics and then evaluate evaluate it the way they want. That is how retailers grow, and that's how the brands become more embedded with with the retailers and really open up the the checkbooks more. Thanks, Mike. Carrie, I got two more for you, and then I know we're going to wrap, um, but we will each leave you with a intellectual gift. Carrie, my, my question, my first question for you is around influencers. You know, like influencers, it's not just happened in this moment, but it's been building and building and building in that there's trust in purchasing, or there can be a trust in purchasing from influencers. I personally on Instagram follow a lot of runners. I am a long distance runner and I've bought plenty of gear thanks to influencers. What are you seeing or happen around influencers? in the space, trust, non-trust. So sorry, I'm using my phone, not because my 16-year-old daughter is actually texting me for money, which she is, but because I have a lot of stats for you. Um, so there's been a 17% increase in the number of Americans who don't trust news media over the last three years. And a lot of that news consumption is going to influencers. And so 14% uh, rise in the number of Americans who say they use social media and influencers to keep up to date with news, which scares me. Uh, here's more scary fun. Uh, the top three most important attributes for influencers are knowledge on the topic, only 27%. 23% care about credibility. So they'll literally turn to a TikTok influencer for their news versus let's say David Brooks on New York Times. Um, because only 23% care about that person being credible, 25% want them to be authentic, and Gen Zs in particular value entertainment over authenticity or credibility. That's scary. Yikes! Yeah, but I mean, you, you can win them, but I guess you really do have to do a tap dance while you're reading the news, I guess, is sort of interesting. So there, influencers are filling this gap of trust, and... Um, being able to do things in an entertaining way is the way to get the audience, especially if you're credible. Sorry. That just honestly <laughs> the very doom the and gloom. I feel me. like I didn't realize how doom and gloom I would be when I was putting this together. I'm feeling very, I'll try and leave on you're a happy spicy. note. Spicy. Yikes. <laughs> Carrie's a little spicy. You're fun at cocktail parties, aren't you? Oh my goodness. I would kick me out. I'm so depressing today. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just... I just like dying over the 
I mean, I do ask a lot of questions every time somebody cites them. I actually can't be friends with some family, extended family members on Facebook for these types of reasons, because I ask questions like, what was your source? <laughs> it's Facebook. It's Facebook most of the time. We haven't gotten to TikTok yet. The last question I have for you is around, you mentioned all these different generations, but one generation, some, a term you mentioned last week was silver tech. What is silver tech? Okay, yay, I have happy stuff now. Um, so silver tech is basically this phenomenon that happened over the pandemic and probably before, where a lot of baby boomers were forced to get more technically knowledgeable because of the pandemic. So a lot of the streaming services like Spotify and Netflix saw their increase in usership from not millennials, because they were already on these platforms, but from baby boomers. And so now, even on TikTok, there's this whole shtick around gray influencers. So grandmas and grandpas that are influencers. And not only that, but not only are more people, more baby boomers on things like TikTok, but they're clicking and they're participating. And like 40, there's a 41% increase in click-through rate from baby boomers on TikTok. Are you, are you confessing over there? What's, what's going on? He's got his phone up. Are you a grandfluencer? Cool, one in the flesh. Anyway, so I thought that was really, actually sort of kind of nice that, you know, marketers and media companies, as they're trying to grow their audience, keep going to the same audience over and over again when it's actually, you know, there's Gen Xers and baby boomers that are really pretty prolific on a lot of these streaming services, TikTok, et cetera. That's where there's a lot of growth. Thank you. I love that it just shows the power of data as well because we can't ignore what it says and how many people would have thought baby boomers were the ones where the growth, digital growth would come from. Okay, last quick thing, quick fire. Sam, what is your actionable takeaway for our, our audience? Uh, I think given that this is the, uh, the year of cookie deprecation again, which is potentially giving the year of mobile a run for its money now, um, <laughs> I think everybody should be really embracing of, uh, of testing and learning. Uh, next year, we're going to see a, a seismic shift in measurement, targeting capabilities, uh, and, and just the internet landscape as, uh, as a whole. Um, I think it's, it's going to be unavoidable that you're going to have to experiment, and I think brands are going to need to embrace it to, uh, to stay ahead of the pack. Mike, okay. you're up. Yep, I'll jump in. Um, build your first party data, partner with people that, I, that can help you do that partner with good people for third-party data as needed. Um, make sure you've got a value exchange to get that data. You can do it. Um, AI, don't ignore it, embrace it. But don't forget the humanity. We believe in humanity and technology. You can't leave out the humanity. And you've got to double check anything chat GPT related. I came across a cover letter. Somebody applied for a job recently. And uh, it was obvious they wrote it with chat GPT. Not a good thing to do. So watch your work, double check. The technology. Our inside joke for that was if the first sentence is, I hope this email finds you well. We're like, oh, that's a bot right there. Polite, though. <laughs> so polite. <laughs> At least polite. Um, I really feel for marketers right now as they try to navigate social issues. So I wanted to leave you with a stat on this, which is a lot of consumers report that they will boycott you. Actually, 56% say if there's hints of racism or transphobia, they will boycott you. So I just wonder if some of the issues some marketers are seeing are not because they stood up for a certain segment, but if they didn't continue to stand up for that segment. If they reversed or pulled back from something that they believed in, because of a reaction from a specific segment. Because what the data shows is consumers want brands to stand up and will boycott you if you don't. And so it's, I'm not trying to say it's not tricky. It's unbelievably tricky. But I just thought that stat was really interesting is what percent will boycott you if you don't stand up for something like racism. So anyway, good, good luck. It's, it's a rough one. I feel, I feel for marketers, but wanted to mention that stat. Thank you, Carrie. Well, thank you guys for coming and hope it provided value. Feel free to ask us more nerdy questions. We'll do our best. Thank you. Thanks, Allison.